Oh, good. Good morning, everyone. It is... <laughs> good morning. It is, for me, a privilege and a pleasure to share with you whatever inspiration I receive throughout the week. What a world we live in. You know, um, if you have been alive in the last 48 hours, you would see what dominates the news. Everybody's saying yes and no. You know, um, the largest item searched on Google in England yesterday was, what is the EU? Anybody notice that? People went to vote and don't know what they're voting for. Those who were on the Remain side decided not to go out to vote because they think it would never happen. Now they have what they call buyer's remorse. You know, they're now trying to see what they can do to rectify the situation, which they really can't do. Interestingly, um, David Cameron and Boris Johnson were classmates in school for many years. And the rivalry between them for the job of Prime Minister has existed since they were teenagers. But they both went to Eton in England. In 1971, there was a book in high school that we used to, had to read called 1984. Anybody read that book? Oh, you've read it. Oh, well, at least there's, what, two, one, two, yeah, one. Okay. In 19... <laughs> Some are saying, what, what, Brother Pretty, I wasn't born then. What are you talking about? <laughs> but there was a book called 1984. And it was scary to read in 1971. Because the way they pictured the world was scary for us. We read it and, you know, we were just, oh, hope that never happens. But you know what? We've gone past that. And it hasn't, we haven't even noticed. <laughs> you know, we were... In that book, the idea was how society was controlled. We're more controlled now than what we were afraid of. We're also afraid in 1999, December 31st. Anybody remember that time? We were scared of this thing called Y2K. And we thought, you know, uh, man, you know, I remember there was somebody I, I went to see um, in December of 1999. And they had uh, a PC on the desk. I don't know if I told the story before. But I said they were afraid of this computer that was on the desk. So I said, look, nothing is going to happen. So I, you know you can change the dates on the computer. So I changed it to December 31st, 1999, 11.58. And the person left the room. <laughs> he was afraid of the computer. Today, we watch and we read about something called Brexit. And we wonder why the U.S. and the U.K. have moved so much to nationalization. They want their country back. I wonder from who. Russia sees an opportunity at this point that with Britain out, they can move a little bit more west without any trouble. China sees an opportunity as well. Because anybody heard of Line 9? Anybody heard of that? Nine, line, nine, line 9 or line, nine, line 11? This is a marking that China has made in the Pacific or in the East China or South China Sea where they want to reclaim a certain part outside of their territorial waters boundaries, the 200 mile limit. What that does is it forces US ships to have to make a huge sail around one area. What's happening now is the US will fly over in a plane to tease the Chinese. And the world goes on. What happens in Brexit will affect uh, our trade because Canada had a deal that was supposed to, uh, took four years to work out that's now at risk with 500 million people now out of that market, uh, out of that deal. Access to markets, economics, even in our own community, there'll be an effect. But as Brother William said to me today, he says, you know, the Bible says they will not cleave one to another. And sure enough, here they are falling apart. They expect that Scotland will have another, ref another referendum. 
Northern Ireland will have one. Um, Germans are going to say, look, we don't want to take all the security risks. So, the, you know, like the Bible said, they won't cleave one to another. Coming closer to home. In the U.S., there was a flood. A developed country like the U.S., 14 people died in a flash flood. In Manitoba, 2,000 people are evacuated for fires. Despite the fire we had before, there's more. And I'll tell you something even closer to home. In Waterloo region, the distressed phone lines that people would call when they're upset are underfunded. It means people are calling because they're distressed. Because our society is undergoing a lot of pressure on a certain level that we don't understand and we cannot afford to support. Homeless levels are not being reduced. And also, you might know this one, in Waterloo Region, we don't have enough doctors. What a world we live in. How do we feel at this time? Perhaps insignificant compared to the problems of the world. But you know what? To God, you're important. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day you've set aside. A day, Lord, when we can come before you and listen to your words and learn and grow and see how merciful and kind you are and how much we mean to you. Lord, as we study today, help that we will leave here assured of your presence, assured of your love, and assured of our worth, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You know, uh, having laid out the world that way, it appears that we're insignificant. But the Bible has another view from the Creator. And one of the first verses I'd like to refer to is Psalms 36. That um, I think that we have someplace uh, on the computer, but I'm not sure if they have it ready. Psalms 36, verse 6 to 9. Psalms 36, 33, sorry, verse 6 to 9. And um, somewhere along the line it will show up, and I hope that it is uh, there for you to read and to see, because I'm not going to... There we go. Right. Now, who... No, why are we here? That's the question. By the word of the Lord was what? The heavens were made, and all of them by the breath of his mouth. How powerful is God? that he doesn't have to actually do it by hand. He has to say, let there be light, and there is light. Let there be animals, and there is animals. And the light that God made in that first day is the same light as the light when he comes again. It defied the laws of nature. The entire world was lit up because light that was left afterwards doesn't bend without a mirror. What God says when Christ says what? When he comes what? Every eye will see him. And because he has the power over light, it doesn't matter where in the world you are, you will see him face to face. He gathers the waters of the sea into a heap. He lays up deep treasures in storehouses. Let all the earth fear him. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand what? In awe of his mighty power. The universe was created by God. Everything that we can see, every thought that we, we have is under his control. Every action, every flower, you know when we go outside in the spring and we want to plant something in the backyard, how good it looks? And when you plant it, how great it tastes? Better than any supermarket uh, uh, products you can buy. Why? You're one-to-one -one with the Creator. No shipping required. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That's who the Creator is. Now I'd like to go a little bit further uh, into, into our relationship with God by looking at Genesis 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. And we have that coming up next. And, it's, and God said, this great and powerful and mighty God said, you know what we're going to do? 
He says, let us do what? Make man in our image. To be as close to us as possible. Right? Not just a random design. But in his image we are made. And you know, when you, uh, when you have children, and someone says, looks just like you, how do you feel? Right? Looks just like you. Image of you. God made us in his image, in his likeness. And then he says, let them have what? Dominion. Give them, put them in charge of all I have already made. These people are special to me. Special to me. But everything else we, we, we mentioned, we read earlier, that everything was done by the word of his mouth. By he, as he spoke, it was done. Is that right? Everything was done as he spoke. But what else is different? Genesis 2, verse 7. We see a change in the routine of creation. Because in Genesis 2, it says here that God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Didn't, didn't speak. Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now remember, animals were already alive. But it was a different life. Not the one that God bent down and said, you know what, into his nostrils will I breathe. And he who was made in my image, someone special, who is going to have dominion, is going to come to life. You know what? That's you and me. We are special. What value do we have? Now I know I won't hold everyone today too long because I know that we have the camp meeting. Uh, everybody's, most people are there and you want to get home for lunch. So I will take as short as I can, but I won't cut what I have to say. How's that, all right? Amen. Okay. But with all that God had made, man became a living being, a very special part of creation, a valued part of creation. There's something else that came to change that particular design. And if we go to the book of John, chapter 8 and verse 44, we see what went wrong. Someone interfered with God's wonderful creation, lovely people that he made, you and I. He says in John, he says, for those who choose not to be part of the family, he says, you are of a different father now. Some people chose make that choice. He says, you're your father the devil, who, and, and you do what your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks a lie from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. So what this liar did was to tell some of our people that God created that they don't have value. He told God's handmade creation that they have no value, that they're not as precious as God has made them. And sometimes we have that feeling. Sometimes we feel that we've been left behind by God, not listening to us, not hearing us, and we are sometimes left abandoned. Am I right? We sometimes have that feeling because the liar has told us that you personally, God doesn't care. Somebody else, but not you. When life gets hard, he says, you know what? I told you, he doesn't care about you. You're not the person he cares about. You're not important. He is the liar. He wants to devalue God's children. The ones made by his hand are his target. Because if he can get you to not have faith in believing in your heavenly father, he says, another one for my team. But I want to remind us all today that we are very special to God. Very special. You know, in our region in Canada, in, in Waterloo region, we have a lot of people who believe that they have no value. Particularly some young people, teenagers, early 20s, who think that the only way out is to take their life. Why? They don't realize, they don't know, they haven't been told how precious they are to their Creator. 
They haven't been given value. The liar has taken over and put in their mind they have no value. Let's remind them that they have value. Let's remember we have value. You know, in Job 7, verse 17, the question is asked, what is man that you should care about him? Of all creation, the most troublesome one is mankind. We're the ones who will defy God to his face. The ones who he made special are the ones who give him the most trouble. How painful it must be to the creator. That's why it was asked, why, what is man? That you should consider him at all. And it says that you should set your heart on him. But the answer to that came in John 3.16. We all know that one. Let's say that one together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whom believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The, despite the liar who tries to convince us otherwise, God says, look, let me tell you something. I love the world, he says, that I'll, gave, I'll give, what? One of my begotten sons? The only one. The only one. Because you are special. Because you have value. Because we all have to remember that Christ died for us. You know, um, as we go through our lives, we have difficulties. No ways, two ways about it. And you know what? People who you don't think have difficulties have difficulties. Do you agree with that? Some folks don't show it. Doesn't mean they haven't got a problem. But everyone needs a savior. Different times in life, you know? Going through Waterloo region and just looking at our statistics alone, you'd be surprised or you may not be surprised to know the percentage of people in our area that are in grave situ situations. Not only those young people, but also other people who have never been able to recover from the econ economic losses we've had, who wonder if they will eat. You know what we have in Canada? A growing reliance on the food bank? Did you know that? We're a prosperous country. It doesn't appear to be that way. Right? People come here to avoid things like that. Isn't that right? But we have that in our own country. Places like Vancouver, where we have a, a houses that cannot be bought by any, any naturalized Canadian. Anybody who's here cannot buy a house. All the houses that are being bought now are people who are coming in and buying them from overseas. Why? They have the dollar advantage. So the mayor says we have to make a new tax to stop them. But the tax he put on, here's a problem for the, for the mayor, the tax he puts on has to be to some degree affordable. But the people who are buying have way too much money. <laughs> they have, the tax doesn't matter to them. The dollar exchange alone, they smile and says, well, how many should I buy? But people who live there cannot afford the homes. You know what the Lord says? Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a mansion for you. No price was mentioned. No deed has to be signed. No mortgage is attached. It is a mansion for you that's create, made by the Creator. So, if you are in Waterloo Region and say, Lord, what should I do? Remember that the house you have here is nothing to the one you'll have when he comes again. Remember that. Remember that if it is that there's a day when you say, Lord, will I eat today? He'll say, yes. But wait and be patient because I will give you what you are entitled to from my throne. I'll, I'll, he also says, you know, when times are hard, remember that I'm with you. It doesn't mean that because you're a believer that you'll never have a hard time. Because if that was the way, everybody would be, be a believer. They say, well, you have no trouble because you're a believer? Let me join that. No commitment, just I'll join that because it looks like the easy way to go. But in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3, we see 
it says, the Lord says, thus said the Lord who created you, and formed you, O Israel, fear not, because what? I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. That speaks to us. Because we are called by his name, and he's called us by our name. And he says what? I have redeemed you, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, what? In difficult times, when th things, things feel like they're way too deep, what does he say? I'll be with you. Right? It doesn't mean you won't go through the water. It means you won't go through alone. And through rivers, they shall not overflow you. Which means, you'll go through the river, but you'll survive. Here are those who went through great tribulation and have been proven to be worthy of the kingdom. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. You'll still go through fire, you just won't be burned. You will survive. Flames won't scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, what? Your Savior. When you hear and you read these words, is it clearer to you how much you mean to God? I'm not sure we're convinced. Now, these are all from His Word. And His Word is inspiration and teaching. Would you agree? Do you understand how important, how valuable you are to God? When he says that he'll be with us, we have to understand that if times weren't bad, we wouldn't call on his name. That's human nature. If we had everything easy, there'd probably never be a prayer said. Never be a, why would you pray if everything was already in front of you without any effort? That's human nature. Even when we have things in front of us, we still grumble and forget to pray. But he says, we will go through the, the, the waters, we will go through the fires, but he will be with us because it's for the perfecting of the saints that tests are given. But we are still precious in his sight, valuable in soul, that God gave his only begotten son to die for you and for me. In Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 and 6, we are reminded again that we're precious to God. Because it says here, in the minute it says what? I will not leave you or forsake you. So it says we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what can man do to me? And that part, when I read that part, what can man do to me? What came to mind was school children in school suffer from, with bullies, right? People at work sometimes get bullied. But in the end, what can man really do to you? Nothing. Fear not him who can what? But anybody know that verse? The body? But here, who can destroy body and soul? Don't worry about what man can do, because you know what? In every situation, God can help you. Doesn't matter what man tries to do, God can help you and will help you. This was a verse that underlined that for me. What can man do to me was what was asked. Because God says right before that, I will never leave you or forsake you. And something else came to mind when I, read the, when I read these verses. You know, sometimes we say that, you know, um, when somebody is passed on, that it's over for them. That they're outside the reach of the Savior. But let me, some, a, voy, a verse came up in a devotional a few weeks ago, which I'd like to share with you. And this is this little book in the back of our Bible called Jude. It's only one chapter long. But in Jude, verse 9, we have a recording, a reporting 
of Jesus fighting with Lucifer over the body of Moses. Moses at this time could not participate, but the Lord knows his children wherever they may be. If you look at that verse, it says there was a dispute about the body of Moses. But Christ didn't argue with Lucifer because he was going back to arguments that had been done before. You know, you ever try to talk to somebody and they start with the very first argument you ever had with them and walk the way through? I know all the guys who are married can say yes. <laughs> that argument that starts and they start back with history. That's always, I always lose those ones. You know, because when they start back, you know, you remember when? I don't remember when. But they remember when. My wife always tells me, remember, you know, she says, remember when you did, and she'll have a year and a month. Right? I, I, you know, and one that keeps coming up is, um, I think it was probably about 18 years ago, if I'm close to the date, where we parked the car in a large parking lot. But when we were leaving, I forgot where the car was. And so we couldn't find it. And she had told me to park under a light. You know, we have the lights, these big lights in the parking lot. And, you know, I said, look, it doesn't matter where we park the car. We will find our car. I was wrong. <laughs> Until today, if there's a discussion about me, can't, me not finding something, she'll say, remember when? 18 years ago. Lucifer wanted to argue about some things that were historical, that didn't matter anymore. So the Bible points out that Christ didn't bother going into those discussions with him. He says, I rebuke you. Stop. This is done. Don't bring up what you cannot do anything about. Forget about it. But the Lord knew his children, and he would fight for Moses, despite the fact Moses had no input. Now. In the same book of Jude, verse 20, we are encouraged, it says, but you, speaking to us, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Because God loves us, what is our response? What is our responsibility? What is our reply? What part do we have? We have the, the responsibility of building up our faith as a reaction to his love. In verse 21 of the same book of Jude, we're told, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord and Savior Christ unto eternal life. Why? If we look at John 14 verse 3, it says, Jesus made a promise why we have to do this. He says, you know what? Because it says, if I go away, I'll prepare a place for who? You. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, what? There you will be also. Why? Because the Creator created us. He paid a price for us. And He's coming to get us back because we are valuable, precious, unimportant to him. When he comes, he says, you know, with all the problems you've had on earth, here's what I'm going to do for you in an act of recreation. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, he says in Ezekiel. And in Revelation chapter 15, which is the last reference I'll make today, Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. When our Savior comes back, when He comes to redeem those who are precious to Him, those for whom He has paid, those who are called by His name, John writes, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, what? Great 
and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come to worship before him, for his judgments shall be manifested. Who won't show God the respect he is due? Well, what's your value? This is what we wanted to, to focus on today. We know that the Creator made us special. We were not made just by speaking. We were not made to be equal to everything else in creation, specially made by His hands. The same hands He used to pay the price for us because we are special. God's only begotten Son was the only one who could pay the price for us. What are we worth? Well, to your family, you're precious. To your church, you represent a demonstration of faith. To your society, you reflect God's love, or should be. But to God, you're not free, you're priceless. Let not the enemy triumph over you because you're bought with a price. Today, the whole thrust of this message is to let you understand, or to let us all understand, that none of us should be without hope. None of us should feel despair. None of us should forget how important we are to God. Because it disappoints him if we forget that, if we forget how important we are. He paid the price for it. He says, I want you to do well and prosper. In this world, though, we have suffering. We're taught by God that we have value, reminded that we are paid for with a price. But today, I think. We need to ask the question, God, give us courage when hope seems to disappear. Open our eyes, Father, so that we can see that you are there. Help us to remember the price you paid for us. Help us to understand our value to you. Help us to remember You've made a home for us. Help us to remember we are your children. Help us to remember that above all others in creation, you made us your children and called us by your name. Help us to remember to pray. Now, as this is being wound up at this point, we can never, in my view, hear the Word of God and not commit to something. Would you agree? Because when it says we're given the Scripture for teaching, when you go to class, you have to learn something. You get tested, you get marked, and you don't want the failing grades. We have to commit fully to God. Last week we had a communion, which again is a, is a commitment to understanding what we need to do to relate to our Heavenly Father, to recommit. But today I want to ask this question as we close. Do you want to be reminded that God is with you? Do you want to be reminded that He's always there? Do you want to be reminded that you are His child? I ask if those are the things you ask, let's stand and ask God to remind us of these things and how valuable we are. If that's what you want. Because we are precious, bought with a price, and we need to understand how important we are, the price paid for us in heaven on, on earth. If you feel that there is encouragement needed specially for you today and you want to come to the throne to ask God for special remembrance please come forward 
if there is something else that you say, Lord, I want to be remembered over and above just what's happened today. I want to be pulled forward. I want, Lord, to be, rem to be reminded that I'm your child when things go wrong. I want to be reminded, Father, that I am always with value, that you have paid the price, and I am worth something. Then step forward. Because the Lord sees everything we do, every thought we have, and He knows when we specially dedicate ourselves to Him, He will come close to us. So today, not only are you standing, but if you feel to come forward in His presence, do so. If we understand how powerful God is and took time out for us as individuals who do not deserve it, but by His grace and His mercy, He's extended to us the opportunity to live with Him in the home that He has prepared for us, you can step forward. Everybody has a chance. Everybody is special. And some of us need to be reminded. We go through tough times in this region of our world. Young people have problems that they can't deal with. Ten-year-old children consider taking their lives. Why? Because the world has lost hope. If you want to ask God to give you the hope that's missing, that you will never lose sight of His face, step forward. And as we bow our heads, we know that our Father is listening, that our Father cares, that He has His heart on every hand, his, and every hand is in his heart. What a precious thing to know that we are called by his name. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we all come before you today understanding that the world we live in is nearing an end. It cannot continue the way it is. Lord, we know that in this world there is despair, hopelessness, and also, Lord, that sometimes it overcomes even those of us who would like to hold on strong. But as you said, we will go through the water, but you will be with us. We may go through the fire, but you will still be with us. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are with us. Help us to hear your voice in those times when we need you most. And everyone, for, Father, who came forward, who has something special to express to you, especially acknowledge their pain, their grief, their need, their want, and your presence in their lives. Lord, we bring before you everything that we face. But more than all and everything, we would like to be among those who you call home for who you have made a place in heaven. Lord, we thank you for listening to us. And may your grace and mercy be with us. And may we have a place with you in it for eternity, we pray, in the wonderful name of, the, of Christ who died for us, the only begotten Son, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.